All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Diana Schultz. Uh, it's July 18th, 2022. We're at the Nicholson Library at Linfield University. Thank you so much, Diana, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, absolutely. Uh, first question to get you started is why wine? Just a small question a small to get question. us started. Uh, why wine? Um, I think that's probably a loaded question. So depending on how far you want to go with that, um, I, I caught the bug. I caught the bug early on, um, long before legal drinking age. Um, I did grow up in the Willamette Valley. It was all around me. Not in the house though. I did not grow up with like, I still don't have any wine drinkers <laughs> per se in my family. Um, I did with an aunt and uncle that lived elsewhere. Um, but yeah, I, I think I was just a little bit fascinated by it. Um, I've also got into the food scene really early, um, and that has continued, and I've, I am, I guess, what you'd call a foodie. Um, very explorative in that scene and how it's connected to region and uh, locality specific. Um, as someone who grew up here in just amongst farmland, um, yeah, I was always, growing food in our own backyard and seeing what was grown and that's still a fascination of mine to be as hyper local as possible while at the same time I have global um, wanderlust <laughs> for all food and wine. Um, I don't know if this is answering the question but to me I, I can't talk about wine without talking about food mm -hmm. and all that food is a sense of place and that wine brings it back to that sense of place. Um, does that? Mm -hmm. Kind there's, of? there's no right or wrong answer okay. to the question, fortunately. <laughs> Great, okay. Uh, so tell us about, you mentioned growing up in the Wyoming Valley. Tell us mm -hmm. about kind of early life, where you grew up, and uh, what kind of path after high school. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Albany. So Lynn County, which is the grass seed capital of the world. Um, so that does mean that I was working um, on grass seed farms uh, in my youth and in, as a teenager. Uh, both some larger commercial farms, but um, my best friend's family owned uh, and still does own some native grass seeds uh, companies, which means hand harvesting with scissors and, and, and doing all sorts of ridiculous tiny, using tweezers to pick out you know inadequacies. I chopped off the tip of my finger. I was running giant equipment and um, you know tractors and forklifts and things. Um, and you know, didn't realize that wasn't every person's experience at that age. Um, I mean, I was doing other things as well. Uh, I got involved in dance and theater at a really young age um, and was bitten by that bug. Um, and so kind of was doing that. I worked in um, early childhood education as well. So, uh, you know, in addition to babysitting and nannying, I worked for a before and after school program. Um, this theme will play out for the rest of my journey as I talk about it, that I've always had multiple um, things going at the exact same time that I've been heavily involved in, cons you know, consistently at the same time. Um, it's kind of a joke amongst my friends and family as if I can't make up my mind, but I feel like I have made up my mind. It just involves a lot of things, all of this at the same time. Um, and so that was, yeah, that was Albany. I was there through high school. Um, going to my high school reunion next weekend, oof. <laughs> and then I decided to pursue theater. Um, so I uh, bounced to Longview, Washington for a junior college theater program that I got a scholarship to um, before deciding to explore um, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. So I did a um, summer program in Hollywood and then decided California did not suit me, so I chose New York. Mm -hmm. And I think I had always wanted to go to New York since I was you know, a child, without ever having been there or knowing much about it. Um, but I always was drawn to it, and uh, basically up and moved to New York City with no plan, pre-internet, no phone. <laughs> um, I went with my best friend and uh, a sleeping pad and a, and a suitcase, and that was it. Uh, and ironically, this weekend and why I'm in uh, McMinnville right now is we just met up with um, my dad's uh, old army buddy's wife. So they've known each other well over 50 years. And she was our savior in New York City. So I had the written address of two humans in that entire city um, and a map quest, maybe, you know. <laughs> 
uh, and we ended up stumbling upon the university she was working at. I can't even remember what it was or what she was doing, and we walked in there. It was pouring down rain, and so we were like, well, let's we'll just go see if she's there. I don't believe we had met. If we had, maybe it was once. Mm -hmm. And so me and my you know, girlfriend were age 20, sat in front of her, and she asked us where we were staying, and we were like, we don't know. <laughs> we had like no plan. And, um, and she goes, oh, well, me and my husband, we're going up to the Catskills for the weekend, so here's the key to our house in Jersey City. Here's the, wrote down the address, it was a brownstone. Um, and so that was just a, you know, miraculous <laughs> saving the day situation. We ended up staying with them for a few weeks until we found a place. But I don't know what we would have done if that hadn't happened. Because um, we really didn't have a plan. So I was in New York for a while. And if you're in theater uh, or dance or any of the performing arts, you basically have to become a very skilled server. Mm -hmm. um, so I had started already. I had been doing you know, theater and dance uh, in Albany, where I grew up, um, in Corvallis, and then in New York City, realized um, that would be how I would make money. And so you know, started serving, started bartending. And that is probably where the first um, real tangible uh, wine exposure happened for me because you know yes I started in a 24-hour diner but then I started working in um, some fine dining restaurants and in one of them the owner just by being in Oregon again Oregon was not most people didn't even know where Oregon was literally I'm not saying Portlandia hadn't happened yet I'm serious I mean it's important to note <laughs> so Portlandia put us on the map in a way um, but I was telling educated adults that I was from the West Coast and they'd say California and I'd say no farther north and they'd go oh Washington and I'd go no Oregon and they'd be like what like nobody knew there was something between California and Washington because we didn't have anything on the map at that point um, and other than one guy I remember had seen a documentary on combining and so he was like oh and just like assumed we lived amongst cows and you know, all that. Um, but I already knew about our wine industry and was almost like a Oregon, you know, tour guide telling people, no, you know, there's, we, we grow wine, we make Pinot Noir, we have all these things. Um, I, you know, somehow been exposed to some of that, but I guess before I left. Um, so I started helping um, the owner of this restaurant put together her wine list. Mm -hmm. At a, you know, I was 21. And, um, but I was really, f um, fascinated and curious about it um, that gave me she started letting me go to all the buyers tastings so at 21 I mean that's that's a crash course in how to keep your composure when you have you know 600 wines and I didn't fully understand the spinning <laughs> yet <laughs> um, so but I learned a lot really quick um, and uh, yeah, kind of continued from there. That's where I, you know, was able to start tasting famous wines of the world, and um, and I think for me the intrigue was it's always the story. It's always you know, you know, you find out that this winemaker, it's her, it's her brother. They have a horse. They plow the, you know, they they harvest by hand. It's this. It's you know the love that that goes into it. I just was drawn. I've been drawn in from the get go on that, um, and that's how I kind of um, retain that information. I think I really struggle with. Um, you know, it's, it's not that I don't pay attention to some of the most famous wines of the world, but it's not until I have my personal experience with them. Mm -hmm. And I had them, you know, at a picnic with my friend next to the river. And, you know, there were a lot of mosquitoes and we were bummed out by that because we wanted it to be perfect. Or, you know, then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, now I have this connection to this wine. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've gone off track again. But, um, <laughs> but New York. So I was in New York for a minute. Loving life poor as can be um, so it was a little dichotomy there of struggling to just you know pay bills or enjoy my life and then tasting $300 bottles of wine um, in a work environment and wanting more of that you know um, yeah and that just continued so I, I became a you know I was a very good bartender a very good server got into catering um, and that followed me uh, back to Portland. Mm -hmm. So when I left New York, the plan was to go to Portland, Oregon, and dominate the theater scene. 
regional credits, and then I would move back and dominate Broadway. Because when I left, there was still no internet, so to speak, other than me going to the library. You know, I was paying you know, my $500 headshots. I didn't know what I was doing, catacalls, and it was not feeling wonderful. So I thought if I just, you know, Portland seemed like I could take it over. <laughs> um, and I ended up, you know, making other choices there, but basically, you know, got into all of that in Portland again. So everything food, everything wine, everything service, catering. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I've actually got into coffee as well. So I had always been a coffee nerd, but really my kind of coffee path and wine path um, have continued to weave. Um, coffee got me into wine, it made me realize I had a good palate, and back and forth with that. So. So when you came back, actually before you come back to Oregon, tell, tell me about the, the, the rest of the experience in New York. Obviously, you're, you're, you're tasting all these wines, you're starting to learn about wine. What did you, did you have a thought about like, that wine would be, that wine would be part of your future? And if so, how would it be part of your future? I think I had a thought and I don't think I knew anything else. And I still feel that way often, um, where I know it's a part of my life, I know it has to be a part of my life and I've always been trying to figure out in what capacity. Um, and I think it started to come together because again, I had multiple jobs, so I was bartending at one place, and I think serving or at another place, plus doing these little catering gigs. And so the the way that wine was used in each place was so different, mm -hmm. you know. So when I was bartending, you know, we had great cocktails and actually pretty good food at this restaurant, but our wine was um, ca Cavite or you know, and Santa Margarita and these magnums of not great wine. And as a person who was already loving it in my personal life. And I'd have, and we were largely a tourist um, place, mm -hmm. destination, because we were attached to a hotel. And so, um, you know, people would come in, they want to try wine they've never tried before or wine that's from the United States, and we didn't even have that. But I knew enough to start to talk to them and go, oh, you know where you should go, or this is what you should try, or have you heard of, you know, Oregon Pinot Noir? Um, and then, you know, in another setting, having French wines and trying to learn how to pronounce those, which I still struggle with, all pronunciation of everything, truly. Um, and, and then in catering, depending on what I was working, if I was working a wedding where people loved wine, I'm all of a sudden opening wines from their personal cellars mm -hmm. and having to use an Oso. And you know, at a young age, you know, getting to try wines that were older than I was. Um, and that, that was, so I, I think I started to see the, maybe the power and also like the, the mystery and the allure mm -hmm. of wine and how, yeah. And, and I, um, it's still a mission of mine, and maybe this is where it started, to make wine accessible to everyone. Because, you know, here we are pouring these wines that were crap at one place, but then, being able to have this information in another environment where I could talk about it and, and to see people get excited about that and intrigued and, and you enjoy the experience more if you have a little bit of information on it. I really do think, I mean, I try super hard to not be the person that drones on and on just because I think it's cool, which I'm literally gonna do today in this interview, I think. <laughs> but um, it's okay. but in, you've, been, you've been asked to. Thank okay. you, okay, good. But in a, like in a service environment, I would always try to keep it to like three bullet points or less and less people. Mm -hmm. But if you give just those three bullet points, right, so they've just got this glass of wine in front of them, they're gonna nonchalantly drink it while they eat and move on with their day. But if you just say, oh, you know, hey, this comes from like, a really hot coastal region in Spain, and it's almost like you can smell the ocean, mm -hmm. you know? And just say something like that, and someone will go, oh my God, you're right. Mm -hmm. And then they're, they're, you know, transported to this other place and time, and, um, and then they'd come back and go, hey, I want that, I want that ocean wine again, <laughs> you know? And I'd be like, yeah, let me, tell, let me give you one more bit of information on that wine and why it's like this. Um, yeah, so I think I was already, and I mean, as I'm saying, I'm realizing here I am in theater and I'm going, well, really what I was doing was stor storytelling, mm -hmm. um, which was maybe already a thing that was, I was comfortable with. Um, and that's what, what kind of fueled that, mm -hmm. that passion. 
Well, on that note, you had talked earlier about how the, the story of wine was something that was so important to you and kind of understanding where it was coming from was so much more meaningful. So as you were starting to learn wines, starting to learn stories, what were the stories that stuck? What were the wines that excited you or the stories behind the wines that excited you or that excited the customers you were selling to? Um, well, um, early on, and I still think of it, you know, everyone's got the one wine that, you know, made them a full nerd or something. Um, I don't think I have the one wine per se, but I do have multiples along the way that were pivotal in kind of aha moments. Um, but for me, it also was a, a region. Like for me, Prairat, when I finally discovered Prairat and what that was and where that was and this style of wine was a game changer. And I was in New York City. I was with my dear friend, Michael Lupo, who took me to a tapas place. And um, and I don't remember if he chose it or if I chose it or the psalm recommended it, you know. And I knew about Spanish wine, but as you know, everything in my wine world, you know, it starts off as this broad. It's so broad, and then you learn more and you learn more and you learn, and it starts to come into focus. And as an educator, I tell people, <laughs> you'll never stop. Like I, you'll never stop learning if you, if you're paying attention, you will never know it all. Mm -hmm. There's no way, and that's what's fascinating, frustrating and fascinating about the wine industry. Um, but yeah, so with that, I can't remember, but I remember just somehow having, you know, at the Spanish restaurant in New York City feeling so fancy because, you know, Sarah and I were eating chicken and rice every day, but then when we'd go out, right, all of a sudden you have this different experience having these amazing tapas and this glass of wine that just blew my mind. Um, it was just such a one, and I, you know, Looking back, the bottle was like a $30 retail bottle. Um, but probably from that day on, any time I've ever seen a Prairat in a store, which over here is typically one mm -hmm. in each mm -hmm. wine location, I, have to, I just have to buy it. I just have to buy it. Mm -hmm. And I normally will let it you know, sell her for a bit. And um, I don't know. So that, that, was, that was a region, I guess I, I could say, that stuck with me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was referencing the brother-sister duo. That's, that's a story I found later, but that is a story that has stuck. Mm -hmm. That's Moss del Metz. That's, um, oh man, I follow her on Instagram. Um, I'll, I'll remember her name in a minute. But she, uh, that's a, just an amazing, I, I, there's several of these stories that I tend to be fascinated with, which are potentially, you know, oh, nearly a century old, chateau and or vineyard and or land that has generationally been passed down and so what i was seeing at that period 10 plus years ago is folks in their late 20s 30s 40s even picking up where their fathers or grandfathers had left off and i say fathers and grandfathers because it was men mm -hmm. so then to see the granddaughter maybe she's the only one in the lineage able to or was the only one interested, but to see women of that age, which you know argu arguably is young, mm -hmm. to take over this um, this whole legacy, mm -hmm. um, and then also we see that age um, start to have a, di a different approach to it, right? So sustainability was already something that is is what the younger generation is looking at or with and i mean it with the horse i can't i used to know all the details when i used to sell this wine i used to know the horse's name you know and all the things but um that was a change that is not what her father and grandfather had been doing but that was her approach of going i'm going to take what they've been doing but i'm going to do it in a way that has no motor motorized anything on my property i'm not going to introduce any kind of you know chemicals or anything inorganic mm -hmm. and um and i admire those stories and i kind of just love to live in the dream of all that and and then assess it too is this necessary is this helpful is this working and so far a lot of that is you know it's these are good choices um you know, Ocha Pinti in Sicily, same thing, if you're familiar with her wines, right? So, and you know, you see a lot of old wrinkly dudes that are kind of upset with what she's doing. Um, but she's in, a, in another sense, like revolutionizing Sicilian wine and, and presenting it in a new way. And she's got all this following because who doesn't love to see a badass woman, you know, 
owning this and, and making it her own. So the, I can think those are the stories. So definitely all, every story that involved a woman intrigued me, if I'm honest, because there were so few. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to remember them. And a lot of that has changed in the last 10 years. And in my personal wine journey, you know, I went from having no female role models to all of a sudden like a room full. And that feels awesome. Mm -hmm. That feels really awesome. Yeah. So you so you come back to Portland and with plans to dominate the theater scene. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me uh, first of all what year what year was this? You came back to Portland. Two thousand nine. Eight, seven, eight, or nine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tell yeah. me, so tell me about, nine, nine. tell me about that. When, when you got back, what, 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 what sort of happened when you got back? Um, I was a little bit of a fish out of water. So okay, I first I um, transitioned in Albany um, with a partner. Um, so I was back in my hometown, but not living, you know, with my parents and went basically right back to the restaurant I had worked at before I left, a steakhouse slash, you know, it was like everything. It was like a steakhouse, bar, bakery thing. And also worked at uh, the wine depot. And like, I had three jobs, I don't know. And then a wine, it was anything that had wine I was doing. Um, and just to kind of jump into Portland. Um, and then I think I started catering. So. Um, you know, my childhood best friend's family uh, was big in the restaurant and catering scene in Portland for decades. Um, owned some restaurant, uh, so Reza Rafferty was his uncle. At one point, he had the mm -hmm. largest personal wine collection, in, I think that was of note in the US. And he was written up in, you know, Spectator and whatever. Um, and again, I didn't have, I didn't get what that meant or anything, but I was working for him and therefore um, would work these good old boy events as a young lady um, and was again exposed to wonderful uh, wines and also saw again that it was, you know, me, 23 or whatever, serving old white dudes um, in a room and not being acknowledged. Mm -hmm even though I was taking their babies and you know like there's so much respect you have to give to in my opinion to the person that's going to um, take care of the bottle that you've held on to for 40 50 years mm -hmm. um, but it was as if I wasn't there you know what I mean um, so that was an interesting environment to learn about that part of it um, but again, a, another crash course in professionalism for me, and um, I had never been faced with some of the, some of these bottles. I had never been taught um, what to do with 50-year-old corks and, and things like that. A lot of it was trial and error, and um, watching what they were doing and doing it. And um, every now and then, one of them would be really kind to me and give me advice or something. But for the most part, I felt like I was not um, a part of it. But I was so happy to work them because then they would leave this much of wine and all those bottles when they left and it was I was my job to clean up <laughs> you know um, but I got into coffee almost immediately um, I'd always been a coffee drinker coffee nerd uh, was really disappointed at coffee in New York at the time because we had co I'd come from the Northwest um, I still think people forget how freaking lucky we are here in every genre of everything that tastes good we have seriously I'm gonna say it for the record we have the best wine, we have the best beer, we have the best cider, we have the best produce, we have the best coffee, we have the best weed. Like, we are so lucky. Um, best meat, like come on. Um, and so I got into coffee and I worked for a roaster, Cafe d'Arte, Italian roaster, uh, family owned, wonderful people. And I started to realize that I could blind taste the blends. I was able to pick out we had seven different roast uh, Italian tradition is to blend, right? So you take, whether it's Honduras, Brazil, um, Nicaragua, you roast each individual, you blend them together, you're trying to create the same flavor profile each time, but will not always be the same origin. Um, and that was a real eye opener for me, um, that other people noticed I could taste that. I may be what they call a super taster, un unsure. Um, and I was super into it. And, um, and again, once I realized I had the palate, I had heard, you know, I'd always heard about blind tasting and wine 
didn't know what that meant. I had heard about all these other things, and I started to realize um, the similarities in those two things. Um, so yeah, what did I do next? I don't know. I was working at restaurants, catering. Um, I can't even, it's just so many things all at once. Bartending, you know, it would always be at least three things at the same time. Mm. One would be coffee, one would be wine, and one would be some other service thing. Yeah. It's a lot. It is a lot. I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not done, but I'm tired. Yeah, it's a lot. And a lot of that was just, you know, this still is, it's cost of living. You know, as much as I'm passionate about all these things, um, would I be working 60 hours if I made enough at one of the jobs to not? Who's to say? Who's to say? Yeah. So, with the, with the, 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 the theater path, mm. was there, were there any, was, was there success there for you? And at what point did it, what was the plan, I guess? What were you, what were you sort of hoping for and how did, how did it go? Um, well, I thought, like I said, I would just dominate the regional scene. And then I ended up um, going entirely a different direction. Basically, the first show that I booked, um, and I'm still dear friends with many of the people involved in that, uh, was a devised piece of theater which at the time I had never heard of. So even though I had gone to drama school and I had done all the high school, you know, improv and the whatever, I didn't know, I didn't know what devised work was. And so I was a part of this process, which basically means, you know, here's your, depending on, you know, who you're working with, how much is already written or decided. But, you know, basically had a director that's like, we have these three goals and we was, we're starting with nothing. Let's see how we get there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I ended up getting cast in a show that was, I think, seven women, and that was not his plan. It just is kind of how the chips fell in auditions of who was, mm -hmm. was working well. Um, and so it was an adaptation of um, a Shakespeare play. And so basically it's a lot of workshopping, and it's a lot of you know, storytelling and trying out different ideas and seeing what clicks and, and creating these pathways and developing character. And it, it was it was wildly frustrating, um, but also super fun and interesting and creatively stimulating. And in that process, I think within that show, there was two other women that I, um, you know, really clicked with. And we decided to start a theater company <laughs> with that uh, vibe. And so we had met a few other folks in the process. Um, and that, you know, kind of changed who the core members were a little bit, kind of took a minute to shake it down, but basically um, started a theater company, a device theater company that was called the Forgery Theater Co. And it was co because we couldn't decide if it was collective, company, or um, whatever the other one. Everyone had a different idea of what it should be, so we just kept it at co. Co-op? Yeah, co-op or collaborative, I think was the thing. Um, and I think I learned a lot in that because everything was like a democratic process. And so it took us a long time to make any process progress. Um, and also half the company was introverts. And I consider myself like an extroverted introvert. Um, so I'm definitely like, I'm a yes person. I say, I want to do everything. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also am like, okay, and now I'm going home. Don't talk to me for two days kind of a thing. Um, but we would get, we uh, had a little bit of traction. We were doing performances. We were performing all over Portland. But it took us forever to even get to that point because basically we were having so much fun coming up with stuff <laughs> that we never really got. It took us a long time to get to that point of showing it to people. Um, and then we ended up having um, this brilliant, wonderful uh, writer, playwright professor, Ellen Margolis, who is still um, a professor and the dean of um, theater and dance at Pacific University. And so she joined us and started writing for us because that was the element we didn't have. Everything we were doing was more physical storytelling and um, all sorts of weird artsy stuff. And uh, anyway, so yeah, we, I, I would consider it a success. Mm -hmm. However, I do feel like we stopped before we peaked. Opportunities were coming in that we weren't saying yes to. It was 
several adults with full-time jobs all going, how do we do that and this? Mm -hmm. Which is such a like bummer thing to do. It is such a, you know, moment where you realize you're not a kid and you can't just like play all the time. Um, I do think it could have continued for a long time. I still think of it as some of my most creatively satisfied mm -hmm. years um, in the theater world. And I, you know, outside of that would still do, and I still do a, a show or two a year. So every time I think I've let it go, I, I kind of can't. So I normally will do about one, one theatrical performance a year. And I also, around the same time as that um, theater company, I joined a dance company in Portland as well and have been a part of that for the last 12 years. And I keep thinking I'm done with that as well. <laughs> and then I kind of get sucked back in mainly because it it's a part of who I am. So as much as I'm, I'm old and everything hurts and I don't have time, um, I, I have to. Like I have to perform at least something or create something and I have to share that art. And it is, it feels very connected to me. Yeah. So moderate success. And, and many things at the same time, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. would be mm -hmm. a theme. I appreciate the yes. thematic consistency here. Yeah. Uh, so back to the, to the wine for a mm. moment. I, I know obviously you, you've gotten into a lot of different parts of the wine industry since then. So yes. tell me how that came out. Let's talk about the wine education for the, to start with. Yeah. How did the wine education start for you? And, and tell, tell, take us through kind of the progression of that. Um, okay, so I moved to Australia. <laughs> Just randomly, um, thought it was going to be my favorite place in the world that I'd want to live forever. It wasn't. I moved back um, when I found out my sister was pregnant. Um, she was pregnant with twins. Um, I ended up moving basically in with her and helped raise the two of them for the first year of their life. Um, twins are a lot of work. I just saw them this weekend. They're eight now. Uh, still a lot of work, like exhausting amount of work. Um, <laughs> but I love them a lot. I'm a very dedicated auntie. Uh, so I did that, but I have to admit that felt like I lost any momentum I had in my life mm -hmm. or any idea of where I was going. Mm -hmm. I was living this awesome, cool life, theater, dance, wine, parties, you know what I mean? Like everything, when you're in that world, you, you get to go to those kinds of fun events. And, and then here I was essentially a stay at home mom of two children for a year and like much respect to everyone who wants that and does that and chooses that. But that hadn't been my, mm -hmm. <laughs> it happened so abruptly. And this was in Eugene, which I had no real connection to. Um, so actually, you know, it's all, it all, no regrets ever, I never have regrets, but um, I also had made quite a few connections while I was there, which are still in my life in the wine world, which is interesting. I found a little wine bar there, met a friend, and da 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 da, da. And actually, folks I met in Australia ended up getting married in Eugene, and you know, that goes on and on. Mm -hmm. um, but while I was there, I started going, oh my God, what am I doing? Like, how do I get back to whatever I'm doing? And when I move back, what will I have? Because I now have this like kind of gap year. I was still driving up to Portland on the weekends and working at a wine bar, which is insane because I was like sleep deprived and all the rest and driving back and with the kids, but I didn't want to let go of that piece. And so I had heard about um, the WSET program, Wine and Spirit Education Trust. And actually one of the um, friends I made in Australia either decided to take it before me and that's how I heard about it or we took it together. I think we took it together. He, sa he signed up, Marcus Chase, and then I signed up. And so even though I was in Eugene, I was like, this is what's gonna pull me out because I have to go up to Portland and get back into this scene. Mm -hmm. um, and this is like maybe 2013 or something by then. Um, and so that really helped. Uh, I needed something to focus on. I also, so I kind of failed to mention this, but amongst all the other things I was doing, I was also teaching dance and theater, directing, doing choreography. So those things, you know, they're sporadic. So I worked for Oregon Children's Theater and staged and a few other companies, but I would just get hired randomly to do one of those things. So it's a lot of juggling and it's a lot of physical it's a lot of rehearsals and things like that. And things were starting to fall apart. <laughs> my knees, my hips, the things, you know? 
And so I remember going, wow, I might need a career that's not 100% physical. And same with bartending, you know, I'm on my feet 12 hours a day, minimum, serving, catering, all of that. There's nothing easy about it. And I am not saying that this is easy, but the education component had already been in my life for years. I had you know, done it with preschool, kindergarten, early education, then was teaching all, every age group for, for theater and dance um, through adults. Um, my mom, I think, always wanted me to be a teacher. I think I've fulfilled that request for her. She just sees it differently, you know. Um, but I do think I'm a natural teacher, and it took me a long time to see that. And so I took the courses with Mimi Martin at the Wine and Spirit Archive. I think she saw something in me, because I wasn't aiming for going into that role, but I did take my courses with her. She saw how I interacted, you know, both with her and the class and the questions I'd ask. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I still, uh, one of the things that is super important to me and I, a skill it took me a long time to realize I have is breaking down something complicated for anybody, mm -hmm. making it, you know, digestible. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have to like wine, but I, I can give you this information. And if you are trying, you know, um, and I, I think it's almost like translating in a way, because I will hear a lot of uh, people in the wine industry start to kind of talk philosophy and all these things in the wine world and it can be overwhelming. And so it's sometimes going, I, I in a room I can't even help myself, I'll kind of look around and I see people's brains like click off, like what are we talking about? And even if it's not asked of me, I will go, okay, so here's what we just said. Like just let me break that down to three sentences instead of 30 minutes. So it's like the Cliff Notes version. Um, and that's a skill that I have um, is how to, be sim like simplify. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Mimi asking her to be my mentor, uh, essentially, because I didn't know what I wanted to do in the wine industry. At that point I had served and sommed and sold and catered and, but I was like, what is that next step? Mm -hmm. I know, like this is a passion, this is, I'm skilled at it, but I don't know what that next step is and I know I can't run around 14 hours a day on my feet. Um, and she had ulterior motives in that meeting and said, I want you to teach for me, which I was like, well, this is awesome. Um, and thank you, Mimi, because who knows if she'll see this. Um, but yeah, so I, uh, I was taken aback. I was unsure. I was intimidated. And I said, well, let's try it. I think I started with, you know, she asked me my thing, or I think she asked me, what classes do you want to teach? And I literally sent her a document that had 47 different ideas on it. <laughs> and she was like, oh, okay, <laughs> like, just one. Let's start with one. It was probably food and wine pairing. I, at that point, was already teaching my own classes at um, little wine bars, and I couldn't help myself. I was so into that stuff. And I basically, when you want to just talk about wine, you're like, got to find someone who wants to hear about it. So I was uh, doing little pop-up education classes, and she knew that and knew they were going well. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, you should do them here. And let me pay you real money, <laughs> you know? Anyway, so that's how I got into the wine education. And it started off really small um, with just some of those kind of trial runs and then teaching the WSET courses, which is its own, it's one thing for me, I can talk forever as you're seeing. It's another to regurgitate textbook information exactly how an institution wants it. Um, so now I've done it enough that it's very comfortable for me, but if I were to you know, every time I take on a new portion of it, a new level, um, it definitely takes some work to get it to come off naturally mm -hmm. um, because you have a timeline with every slide and every statement. Have you taken any of those? No. Okay. Oh, you have? Which one? Just the first one. Okay. No, there's no way I taught you then, right? I'd know you. Okay. Okay. Because I do here. teach. Huh? I just took it here. Oh, so did Jess teach that? Tony. Tony. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, I teach that in Portland and um, I love teaching the level one because it's kind of that place where some people are just like, ah, I got nothing else to do. There's so many people that are like, I'm a computer programmer and they take it and I'm like, what are you doing? Or nurses or, you know, just like people that I'm like, your job is so intense. I can't believe you want to do <laughs> like this too. And then there's, you know, people in the industry or not. And then at the end of it all, sometimes you've caught them. 
you know, like there'll be two people that you know they're in this for life now because they're so intrigued and um, and I love that feeling. And even if they move on, I'm like, at least you have this like base knowledge and your mind was blown because even level one, everyone wants to, you know, poo poo basic levels, but it's, it's harder than you think. And it, I guarantee you, you'll learn something, you know, because we all think we know everything like this. And then you just got to kind of open it up to the world and go, oh, wow. Yeah. There's a lot out there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So when it comes to learning what you need to teach and then also teaching it, what have you found to be the most interesting parts of it for you? And what are the, the things you find are most kind of, the students are most kind of catching on to or most excited by? Um, I think that's kind of connected because what I tend to gravitate towards are the questions that I get. And um, if I can also, um, you know, be critical of myself, it's also figuring out how to simplify my responses because often what happens is these questions are, are pretty big mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, this is what you want to know. And then I'm like, oh, wait, that's, that, I, that's too much. We need to start here, you know. Um, but I will say whether or not it's coming from the students or it's from me and I have now, like, put it on the students, I think I get folks really excited about the food component because I'm so excited about it and because I think it's so, if you're not thinking of it, I want you to think of it. And it doesn't have to be your favorite thing, you know, but it's my favorite thing. And I spend most of my days and time thinking about what wine's gonna go with what food and what food's gonna go with what wine and I don't want to have one without the other, I just don't. And I, I'm always thinking of, just those, because it's now it's an experience. It's mm -hmm. it's a whole different thing. Um, and if there's anything I can impart impart on um, students, also is just paying attention. That's really what it is. People, everyone's been drinking wine. I have students in my course that are in their 60s and they're retiring, and now they want to learn about it. They've been drinking wine forever. They have collections. They've probably spent more money on wine than I have. Um, but they've just been drinking it without ever paying attention. And it's such a different thing. And that's also just an American thing to just stop and take a breath and look at it for a second, smell it, take a sip, and then what's actually happening, you know? And there's so many things where we go, oh, I really like this, and then go, but why? Like, why do you like it? Like, what is happening in your mouth and that feeling that you love so much? Or is it? an emotional memory that you're connected to because that's often as I said it for me and then you add that you know I literally this last couple of classes I gave folks goldfish crackers and it sounds silly but like just you know you you're serving someone a Bordeaux or a Chateauneuf and it's tannic it's acidic it's you know it's noon <laughs> you know what are we doing drinking this wine right now but just give them a little something salty a little fat whatever and then have them try it again and watching everyone go whoa you know I, I think um, wine's so subjective and in the education environment it's really easy to just be like I don't like this um, especially with these high acid white wines and I'm going oh but you would if I gave you an oyster, you're going to beg for that glass of wine. It's going to, you know, or that sparkling. It's perfect pairing. Give me some fried chicken and a Chardonnay. Oh, my goodness, you know. Um, so I don't know if that answers it because it's kind of both. But I do think because I love it so much, I then see what happens is at the end of a class that is not about food and wine pairing, by the end they're going, okay, well, what do I pair with tomatoes? You know, or what do I pair with? I made this the other day. What do I pair? And so that because it, it's cl opened a door for someone where they've gone, oh, I never thought of it that way. Um, and then everyone wants to come to the food and wine pairing class because you're going, it is a whole thing. And But I almost can't leave that part out of any class. I feel like you at least have to like reference it because that's what I think we're all doing in this industry is trying to find that like perfect balance, whether it's, you know, in the grape on the vine, in the winery, in the glass or paired with a plate and we're just looking for that perfect balance somewhere along there you know it makes me hungry <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have to have oysters afterward yeah i'd love an oyster back. 
Uh, so you mentioned uh, upon talking to Mimi at first, uh, mm -hmm. you had you had a lot of ideas for classes mm -hmm. you might teach. So tell me how that has progressed. What have you taught? Uh, what are you kind of proudest of when it comes mm -hmm. to teaching? And maybe what's next? What are you? Are, are there still things you're looking forward to teaching in the future? There's absolutely more things I'm looking forward to teaching in the future. Um, I think that's going to be a long, yeah, never-ending thing to get through my list of 47 ideas, which was a first draft. <laughs> um, and Mimi is absolutely open to all of it. So it really comes down to schedule and life and, and then what students are interested in. And so what tends to happen is we find something that works and then we kind of offer it quarterly. Um, and it t it's a title normally, but it'll be a certain title that really draws people in, and then it's you know there's always a, a demand for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really proud of. At one point, she said, "What would you, what would you teach?" And at that point, just based on the little you know, elective courses I had done in the W set, I was like, "What are these questions that end every class that we're not getting to still?" And so I created a three-part course called From Grape to Glass. So that, because one class, one hour and a half, two hours, really flies by when you're tasting wine, because a lot of that is the observations of the wine. Mm -hmm. um, and so to really, we do two different three-part classes. We also do like a Wine 101 or something. I can't remember what it's called, or Palette Primer, something like that. But having the same students for what ends up being, what, five and a half hours or six hours or something, is so, so um, wonderful. <laughs> and because there's such a shift, like so much more happens, both in just the bonding in the room and the comfortability, because everyone's always nervous at the start of these little classes, until you give them wine. And then, um, but to have them come back the second time and they've digested that information, they've maybe thought about it all week, they've bought another wine, they've gone through some of the points we were talking mm -hmm. about, they've linked it, you know, they're making all these connections and that's again, that's a big part of it that we all know, right, is we're connecting it to where, you know, the sense of place, the, the weather patterns, the soil type, the what are they doing in the winery, what, you know, what are we pairing it with here in Italy that we can recreate back home. And um, so, so for me, that class has been satisfying because I feel like I'm, I'm maybe satiating what, what people are antsy for. Mm -hmm. um, and or by the end of it, they're intrigued and now they want more and more, you know, which is super fun. And then I go, okay, well maybe you want to take a more serious step into a certification program. But that, so I'm really proud of the grape to glass class. Yeah, and I think it's a good one. And I think some people are intimidated by the three-parter, but I think um, there's no need to be intimidated. <laughs> yeah, and you get a lot of wine out of the deal, so. You know, it's like nine wines every class. Like that's a lot, yeah. It's a good ROI, I would say. Yeah, oh, totally. Uh, tell me about uh, the as 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 you have taught more, and uh, how have students changed? How does have the students who've come to you changed? Are they looking for different things? Are they asking different questions? Are they expecting different things? And um, and how have you? How are you kind of finding that? that finding them the way to match that. That's a great question. Um, especially the last two years, things have gotten crinkly because um, I you know we went online for a while um, and we're just now back in person again um, I'm not sure if this is statistically accurate but it does feel as if my the student population for the elective courses has gotten older mm -hmm. um, more people are retired or close to retirement a lot of it is we want to travel and we want to know what we're saying you know, that's, I mean, I hear that from everyone is, I know what I like, but I don't know why I like, it. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to order. I don't know how to, you know, and people are actually like kind of really hard on themselves. I'm like, you do know, don't be scared, you know? Um, I think there's a little bit of a, um, I don't know if marketing's the right word, but there's a little bit of a marketing issue in our, in the wine world. I think uh, the fact that people are feeling intimidated to ask for things, tells us that we have kind of uh, turned this, you know, we have this like a little bit of this like snobbery 
fun. People think it's so fun to be like, it's so fancy and ritzy and you gotta wear a suit. And then it kind of like leaves out a lot of people mm -hmm. um, unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. Because for us living here, right? If we go to a winery, we go to a vineyard, the winemaker or the you know vineyard manager, they're in overalls and Carhartts. Their boots are dirty. And in harvest, our hands are dirty. They're stained. and. Then you go to a wine tasting and there's a white tablecloth and it's, you know, costs $125 to be there. And, and I'm not saying it's not worth it. The value is there, but there's this disconnect of it's agriculture. Mm -hmm. Like this industry is agriculture. At the end of the day, it's farm. We are, it, and I think we remove it sometimes when we get into the Psalm white gloved situation where we forget that mother nature is in charge of all of this at the end of the day. We are trying to be good stewards to the land. We are trying to work with what we have. And, and then let's make it accessible to more people. That's, mm -hmm. that's me on a little soapbox. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I, to get back to your question, what I'm seeing more of is the awareness of that. Folks wanting to know what organic means, what biodynamic means, what is natural wine? That's a never ending thing that we all should be talking about because there's not a lot of us that can define it here locally and we don't have anybody regulating that. Um, so there's a lot of words out there um, that people are confused about, you know, orange wine, that kind of thing. So people from where things were 10, 20 years ago, where it was a magazine or a restaurant to Instagram, like, beautiful why I mean I I'm a sucker I follow all of them uh, show me every variation shot you've got I'm into it you know I love I love all that but it's a lot coming at you now and it makes you feel like oh to to like wine I have to in some way understand this or be a part of this mm -hmm. um, and so those are the kinds of questions I'm getting is is a little bit of like there's a lot of like embarrassment um, uh, or, or people being timid they don't want to tell me what they like because they've heard it poop. No one wants to like Merlot because of Sideways. <laughs> and I'm like, that's now old. That's old news. We've let it go. It's coming back. It's fine. <laughs> and we do talk about that in my wine classes, these trends, mm -hmm. you know, the White Zinfandel and things like that, why, why that's changed. And, and at the end of the day, I want everyone to know, if you're buying from the bottom shelf and it brings you joy, do it. Do it. I'm not trying to take that away from you. I might not like that wine. If you like that wine, like that wine as long as you can, because at some point you might change your mind and then when you change your mind, it's gonna be more expensive. <laughs> it just is. <laughs> and I'm to a point where I'm like unsatisfied with everything. I'm like, just bring me other things. I just always want something else. And so even though I have all this wine, you know, in my house and then I'm just like, I have nothing to drink. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I think I see that. I see a lot of people just trying to understand what, what is in their face. and. I do not, don't let me go on a tangent on this, but I hold so much frustration with other marketing that I'm seeing that includes the words sugar-free, low calorie, this is your healthy wine, this is your clean wine, this is your diet wine. No, no thank you. Celebrities who are endorsing this and somehow now have five million people buying this bottle of wine because they're holding it up on Instagram really bothers me. Mm -hmm. It's hurting our industry and it bums me out because they don't realize that, no shame on them, but like trying to advertise this is the wine you drink post-workout, give me a break. <sighs> okay, don't let me, don't let me go down there, but that bothers me a lot for the record. Mm -hmm. It's on the record now. It's on the record. So at some point after all the other things you've done, basically mm. everything there is to do in wine, not exactly. Except mm. you decided to get into production. Right, and I also hadn't gotten into viticulture, which is still on the list. Okay. Um, I, mean, I have toes, toes on the edge right now okay. in it, but um, I do hope to get into viticulture in a bigger way eventually. Okay, well, we'll talk about that. Okay. Yes, production. So, exactly. I had not done that yet. I had uh, gotten to sales, retail, teaching, um, everything else on the front of the house. Mm -hmm. And it was in teaching that uh, folks were asking me, especially in my WD set classes, production questions. 
and I was answering with textbook responses that I'm supposed to answer with and realizing there's no way that is the full story. And again, with the story, right? So, because there's a lot of things that I'm sure you even felt, right? Uh, or anyone who's taken WSET is like, wait a minute, what about Oregon? Come on, WSET, what about Oregon? Um, you know, when I started, it was not included. Then level two, it was one sentence included Oregon and Washington. Then it turned into a paragraph. Uh, for level three, it is, you know, because that was uh, 10 years ago-ish, um, we now have a full page. But in comparison to 24 pages on Bordeaux, you know what I mean? We're not quite there yet. But we are competing with Burgundy and New Zealand for the top Pinot Noir in the world. And everyone's sleeping on our Chardonnays, which is good for us right now. But like, someday they're gonna figure out our Chardonnay. So buy it now. Um, that's a tip. Anyway, um, what was the question? <laughs> I lost it. Production. Production. So uh, folks were asking me questions. I was giving responses. The answers, and this is still true, I feel like, with any um, international school, they're going to give you this answer. But the wine in industry has never been black or white. Nothing is ever finite. Um, do people inoculate or do people use natural yeast? Like, yes, but like, it's yes and. Like, this is a long conversation, and why, right? And, and, and to not confuse people in these courses because they're not in that next part, right? You have to keep it simple so that they can pass their test. And then the next level, we might go farther. And then in the next, you know, in diploma, you start to talk about other things. So um, with that, I will forever want to know more. I will always want, as an instructor, I want to feel confident that if you ask me a question, I can answer it. And so I was realizing I needed to get my hands dirty. And so um, I started, you know, I've of course had wine friends um, and wine maker friends and had dabbled here and there with, you know, helping them bottling a day or harvest a day. And so I started doing that a lot more. Um, and doing it kind of in all my free time, which there wasn't much, but it was enough. Um, and I was loving everything I was learning and it was clicking for me in a way that I didn't even, there were so, things that seemed so simple, but in a textbook you're saying in one answer and it just kind of is like, what, why? And then you see it and you're like, oh, this is why, like immediately. And, um, and so it all clicked together for me, just, just helping out. And I was really lucky to have friends who were just willing to kind of just go, yeah, join us in this process, watch this, observe this. Um, and anyone can respect if you're willing to give time. If you're willing to you know, give time, labor, sweat, break your back a little bit, um, it's super appreciated. And so my you know, winemaking mentor is Bradford, Bradford Cowan. And he, um, basically, I probably was helping with his wine for a few vintages in multiple ways. Um, I'm also just a natural networker, and if I like something, I'm in the right place at the right time to talk about the right wine sometimes. And so even just that feels really good for a winemaker to know you've got an advocate out mm -hmm. in the world. And um, so, almost as a favor, we had never talked about it so much as just I was putting in hours of labor. Mm -hmm. And he would always try to give me wine. I'd take a little bit, but I'd always be like, no, no, no. More like, you hold that favor, let's let that favor grow, kind of a thing, um, for a few years. And then it became, hey, there's extra fruit available. I think you should get some fruit. And and another time, place, person, I don't think I would have. Mm -hmm. I've always been intimidated by the reality because I know the reality. The same way that I will never open a restaurant because I worked in restaurants forever. I helped people open restaurants. It's not romantic. It is exhausting. Um, same way that I won't open a wine bar. It sounds fun, but you won't see me do that. I've, I know too much. <laughs> The same, so with winemaking, I was like, I'm gonna let the winemakers do what the winemakers do. But this opportunity felt um, safe and simple, and it was already something I was building into my life at the time, in terms of when my time was there and how much time I was giving. Um, 
I was lucky because of having multiple jobs, part of why I've always had multiple jobs, it's easier to fluctuate your schedule. Um, you know, maybe one's salaried here or one's 20 hours and one's this. And so then therefore you can be like, okay, I can open up this whole week. I'm going to go pick up fruit. I'm going to do this thing. And so that's kind of how that happened. It was the year, um, 2019 is the first year I got my fruit. Um, there was a bunch of frost uh, in certain areas. It was freaking people in Eastern Washington. There was people freaking out, dropping contracts left and right. Um, that is not how I got my fruit, but I just distinctly remember driving through Eastern Washington and just seeing vineyard after vineyard after vineyard full of fruit left to die, which was heartbreaking and confusing. Mm -hmm. um, but I had, I don't know, I, I was able to tag along on contracts he had already built. Um, if you're not already aware, that's like a, a big thing to have this relationship. People don't let those go very easily. So it's the more you know people, the more that's important. Those relationships are important. Um, and it's really hard as a small winemaker. I just want, you know, a ton here or a ton and a half or two tons or something like that. And most people don't want to work with that. But if I can go, hey, this person's buying five, can you make it seven? Um, and you already have this relationship going and a good rapport. Uh, so that's how that happened. And um, I absolutely love the wines that Bradford makes with Adega Northwest. And so I wanted to learn as much as I could on, on what he was doing and um, and then it continued. Mm -hmm. That's I guess what that is. And even just one, it was so to, to work a harvest as a person who's just there dancing around and doing what I'm told to do versus being responsible for my own thing was a game changer. And any question I didn't know yet I had to figure out. And so again, it instantly made me a better instructor on the production side of wine. And that's why I still make it on the side as well, because I can, I can follow a list for other people. I can do what I'm told, but to have to be forced with a decision, an idea, getting creative with it, um, to me, that's how I learn best, hands-on. Hand, I need hands-on and I need repetition. Um, yeah, and I also like it so much more than I could have ever thought. It's really fun. It's really fun as someone who was a psalm for forever in sales. And I love talking to people and humans, but it's kind of really fun to go to work in sweatpants and boots and, you know, listen to a podcast or whatever and just kind of have time with the barrels and the wine. And it's, it's kind of great. It's kind of meditative. Yeah. So as the, as the fruit came available, uh, tell me about all the rest of it, of figuring out you're going to be a commercial winemaker, all the things that go into that, coming up with a label and a name and, and, a, and a way to sell it and all of that. So tell me about, the, especially that 2019, mm. how, did it, how did that go? How were how the, the decisions made and how did that wine turn out? The wine is delicious and amazing. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't say that <laughs> if I didn't really believe it. You're, um, you're a psalm, so you, you, have yeah. to, you have to tell the truth. I do have to tell the truth, and I was very nervous. I'm still nervous about each vintage because of that. Because, and I will also tell you, this is the part that I'm like, do I want this on the record? You know, I came across smoke tainted grapes in 2020, and I made a bunch of wine that was smoke tainted, and I have since distilled that wine, and I have a bunch of moonshine now, brandy, you know. Not all of it, and I still have other wine and bottle that I, as as a psalm, a previous psalm, and as someone that I really want you to trust what I'm saying and respect it, and know I'm not going to steer you wrong. I would never serve this wine to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a hard lesson, an expensive lesson. Um, but yes, the my 2019 Tempranillo I think is absolutely wonderful. I was so nervous about it. I also learned more about how wine shifts and changes and goes through different phases and I never understood it. I still don't understand it, but I at least now maybe know to expect it. Mm -hmm. um, I remember still having friends come in and barrel sampling at one point and I was like, this is not behaving. Like this is not what this wine is supposed to taste like and I was not proud of it in that moment. But I was like, I know it tasted good, you know, a couple months ago, like what's happened? And so kind of learning that it's, 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 it's growing, it's adapting, it's evolving. Um, that's been an interesting lesson. Um, and, and I am 
doing this for myself more than anything. I just have this byproduct of wine I now have to deal with. Um, so to answer that part, uh, luckily, everything I mentioned before, catering, serving, da 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 da. I've had, you know, I did a pop up business with a friend in the gorge where we did cultural, you know, food and wine dinners. I did another one in Portland where we paired with a chef. And these things come naturally to me, and they're also my favorite things to do: is to host people and pour them food and wine. That's how I want the majority of my wine to be served mm -hmm. and sold. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to create the experience, the event. I want to host people. I want there to be a personal connection. Um, you know, fast forward eight years and my business partner might be like, okay, enough of this storytelling, I don't know. But for me right now, that's how I see it. Um, and I think it can be done. And I, no shame in grocery stores at all, but I don't feel like I'm making a wine that I just want anonymously on a shelf. I'm hoping I don't make enough that I need to do that. Like I said, for me, it's kind of a learning experience that I just want to continue for my own mm -hmm. until I figure out what it is I'm doing. And that's kind of me in my life. It's, it's, it might take me 10 years and then I might go, okay, you know what? It is going to be Cab Franc that I do now forever. Um, and then I might go, OK, I'm going to triple my production. But for right now, I'm still dabbling. I'm still trying out different styles and, and, and what I'm after. I want to emulate wines I've tried around the world. I want to also not. I want to go, how do I make this unique to, to me and my time in this space and, and where I'm getting the fruit? Um, yeah, and when I reference business partner, that same childhood best friend that we were talking about, Lee McCollins, um, who's highly skilled in all things marketing and graphic design, and, and he's helped me with the labels and the website, and, and we have officially talked about going into business for real, for real, together, um, which intimidates the hell out of me, which is exactly why I need him, because I will just sit here quietly in a winery and make wine for a long time and share it with my friends but I am running out of room <laughs> and I will have to show it to other people and other people are curious and want to try it and you know I've been able to have a couple private things but um, he's gonna help me get it to that level um, that we'll need to be at to sustain mm -hmm. yeah that's what you asked right production sale oh the name and he came up with the name that was my next question Augustina Sellers um, so my name is Diana Marie Augustina Schultz, and he just said it's going to be Augustina Sellers. I tend to just do whatever he says. I did <laughs> say, well, he goes, come up with, basically it was like, come up with a better name. Uh -huh. And I asked all my other friends, and everyone came up with names because I was a dancer, like, it should be Dancing Diana. And I was like, no. Or Dirty Diana, <laughs> no something about your feet like you know like people are just the weirdest suggestions because I do the you know pijage I've always that's what got me into it I should say with the other winemakers was I was full on ready to stomp the grapes for them and these guys had been making wine long enough it's not fun for them anymore but I'd be like I'll do it so I was the notorious girl that would come every harvest I'd stomp everyone's grapes <laughs> and then and I loved it and so they're like that's what it should be is you stomp and I was like no that I am not trying to make a critter wine or a you know, a gimmick. Um, and so no one had a better name. And I like that it's both personal, but that you wouldn't necessarily know it's mine. Um, yeah, so it's Augustina Sellers. You talked about uh, kind of a, the projects for you, and, and you weren't necessarily thinking about, at the time you started, necessarily making it enough to, to sell or to, to, to distribute or anything like that. but. But now your wine's out and you've, you've given it to people. And I'm, I'm curious about that experience for you. What, what's, what's it like having that wine with your name literally on it that you're handing so to someone? So nerve wracking. I have never, I perform. I've performed thousands of people. It is so nerve wracking. And I think how you heard about me was through someone at the Woven Wineworks event that I did. Um, I've never, never been so nervous as I was to talk to 10 people about my own product. Because um, we just had these little private seatings, 10 or 12 people at each one. It was really lovely. It was lovely. It was such a 
amazing. I'm so glad I said yes because I wasn't going to because I was like, you know, I don't think I should do that. You know, I'm still. I felt so. I was trying to be secretive about this. I think for a long time because I'm not someone that ever says I'm doing something unless I'm doing it. I don't announce things unless it's real. You know, um, and because I think of this as a learning, growing, evolving mm -hmm. skill. Uh, it's really hard for me to just go, and here it is, you will love it. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, everyone's loved it. <laughs> um, and I poured a second wine there as well. Um, and I also, coming from a family that doesn't drink wine, that's been tricky, because I'm so excited and I wanted to share it with them. And, you know, literally, smells like wine. <laughs> Tastes like grapes. Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah, woof. <laughs> Just really not helpful. Um, and so it's you know it took me a while to feel confident enough that I was like I I know this is a good wine and I am okay serving it to people. But it doesn't mean you have to like it. That's the other thing with wine. Just because I like it and I made it, then it's so intimidating. The same New Yorker I was mentioning, Ellen. Um, you know, she goes, Well, I want to try your wine, and then. You know, you're sitting around a table and you're talking and I'm aware of every sip she's taking and that she hasn't like said anything. And I'm like, oh, if she hates it. And you know, it's for me personally, that's been a huge challenge. Um, I'm sure I'll get over it. But that's why I wanna do event style. I do great when I'm like, I know this pairs perfectly. Have that experience. You know, you're now, you're in my home or we're at this place and it's, you know, I'm giving you, I, I can throw, I can throw you a party better than I can just like, be like, drink my wine, you know? Um, so that's why I think that model will work for me. And this is another thing I wasn't sure I'd want to put on the record, but as a performer, I'd been dreaming for a long time that what I think I'm going to do when I go to release my wines is it will be like a show aspect. Um, Amazing. Is it? I think it's amazing. <laughs> so it's been taking, it's taken me a year. So I had come up with this idea long before I made wine, but I was going to make a show that paired with a wine with each, you know, story and kind of connect them to travel stories and, you know, different, I have all sorts of things I wanted to, you know, share, but they were going to be wines of, from everyone else. But then now that my world has turned into winemaking, I was like, I think this is how I release my wine. And so the dance company that I work for owns a, or work for dance with um, has a venue and it's, it's, it's almost as if it's how I dreamt it because I didn't have it then, but I was like, it needs to be comedy style seating or jazz style seating, little tables. Someone comes around, pours you your next wine. You don't even know what you're drinking until you hear this whole story, right? And then you're like, and by the way, you know. Um, and so that's the plan. And so I've been kind of, you know, tight-lipped about things, I think, because I'm not trying to dump the wine. I, everyone's going, hey, I know this person, you could sell all of it at this, and I'm like, no, 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 like, I, I don't know if this sounds narcissistic, but I really want to know who's drinking it. I want to share it, and I want it to be connected with me so that you have that. And again, you don't have to like it. You can walk away being like, oh, that redhead, she talks a lot. Wine was fine, but come on, you know? Didn't go blind. Huh? Didn't make me blind. Right, right. Or they could be like, that was such a cool, weird thing I just went to where I saw this show and had this experience and drank this wine and um, or went to this party. Or, and so that's kind of my thing is I'm kind of just, I feel like I'm kind of collecting and building um, for that mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Although I'm also slowly drinking it and giving it away as well, so <laughs> we'll see how much I have left. Yeah, because that's what's too bad is my first vintage was only one barrel, so it's really not that much, and so that is dwindling. Fortunately, I have more of 2020, and I've got you know six barrels working, and but I, I want to stay small for now. Yeah. You mentioned Bradford, your your mentor mm -hmm. in the wine. Tell me about. Uh, what you've sort of gotten from him mm -hmm. and what your now that you've done it a couple of times mm -hmm. what have you changed what are you doing this unique what's, what's your style um, well because I've changed varietals like I said each thing still feels like a new learning um, opportunity um, I think what I picked up and he comes from a similar background in that he was a psalm as well and high end you know badass salmon in New York City 
Um, but we come at it from different ways because I went through WSET and he went through international, you know, like just the, the mindset is different. He can tell you every large producer and famous Yahoo and the wine world. And I can tell you the wind patterns and the soil of which that grape was grown and how it might compare to yada yada. Right. So it's just a different way of looking at it. And there is some complementary st skills that we share in general. I think, um, I don't know what the word is. Uh, it's not that he's strict, but he's the decisions he makes are very precise and very important. Mm -hmm. And he was careful to not go, hey, this is exactly what I do, copy it. But he'd go, this is a way you could do it. This is a way you could do it. I'd recommend something in this realm, you know? Um, but he kind of also would say this. And then there would be other times where he's like, don't do it that way <laughs> or something. And so all of those things, definitely you internalize really quick, right? Just like when you're being trained by anyone to just go, okay, this can't be done. And those things still feel really important to me. Um, and I see why now. And it definitely took me time of doing it to go, he's right. And I'm stubborn and he's stubborn. And we have one of those friendships where we clash heads sometimes. Um, but more often than not, he's right on <laughs> all of the the winemaking stuff, because he's definitely been doing it, you know, four times longer than I have. And so it's helpful, though, for me to stumble and then understand why, because he's not a good instructor. Like the way that I was saying, I can take something complicated and break it down. He doesn't do that. So I'm having to almost like create my own based on one like gesture or word. I'm going, OK, what what's the lesson here? Um, so again, there's 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 things about that that have have been beneficial and also frustrating for both of us, I'm sure. But um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers it because I also feel like I don't want to give away my, my secrets. But um, I have anything that I that I know about his wines that I love, I want to do as close to what he's doing as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have tried to to keep all that. And then what's fascinating is how different it'll be anyway. Because mm -hmm. um, his assistant winemaker, there is one vintage where the three of us got the same fruit from the same grower, same vineyard, same year, same pick date, right? And we made a few different decisions at the very beginning of Crush, but the wines are wildly expressing in different ways. Like there, there's no way you'd blindly go, oh, this is all from, you know? And that's what's, again, amazing and fascinating about wine. And also we kind of can't even figure out why. Because there's some things that are so similarly done that you're just like, what, why? How is it doing this? Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing, I think, um, in the wine world that, that uh, cause I don't want to try to be a copycat, but as I said, I want to copy everything that's working as well. Um, so, so yeah, I feel like just this, there's certain strict things um, or just like protocols or cleanliness or things that, you know, he drilled in really quickly. And I feel like that is, I will forever mm -hmm. follow those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then try to pick his brain whenever he's not thinking so I can get more secrets out. <laughs> You mentioned viticulture is kind of the, the final frontier now. So tell me about what you would like to do in viticulture, maybe what, what's coming next. It's it's on the same vein of as an instructor, I want I want to I want to have the dirty hands to, to, mm -hmm. to talk about that aspect of it as well. Um, the winery I work for now in Washington um, just acquired a vineyard. And so it's been a crash course kind of for all of us to try that out. <laughs> Fortunately, it's not my job to like do it, do it, but I wa also want to be a part of it. So I mean, even just last year or even for my own wine, I made the uh, uncomfortable decision to hand harvest my own fruit at one of the places. It is hard work. It is slow. It's slow for me. It's not slow for the professionals who do this. They are amazing individuals that we have working out there for us. And most people, you know, in different regions are working for every single vineyard out there. And they're so professional. It's amazing. So that was a, um, 
a wake up call. And that was just cause you know, I didn't, I don't have a crew. And, and so I chose to make some of these, these decisions. And then I was like, wow, this is a lot of work. Um, but yeah, I think I've dreamt like maybe a lot of us do. It's like the opening restaurant thing, right? Where I'm like, maybe I own a vineyard someday, or maybe I this, or if I owned a vineyard, then I'd sell myself fruit and I'd, or, you know, I'd have my own fruit to make my wine or, um, so I've thought about that. I don't know what that looks like yet. I have so many dreams of, of living in different parts of the world still. So I'm like, is that what I do? Or do I develop that skill here? And, um, I don't know. Um, but with this vineyard currently, we're looking into the Simonet and search method, which are these two baddest Italian guys. I have just like this weird affinity to Italy where I am like desperate to, go there, live there, be there. Italian wines are my favorite. I worked for an Italian coffee company. I worked for Remy, which is Italian wines. Like at one point in my life, everything I did was Italian and I've never been still. And I had a plan to go in 2020, which of course. Um, so that's just, I, it's just like this thing calling me. I'm an Italian wine ambassador. I would like, or sorry, I'm an Italian wine scholar. I'd like to become an Italian wine ambassador mainly just so that I hopefully have a reason to go there potentially every year. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, I don't know what I want with the vineyard. I just know that I have now been a part of some pruning and some thinning and some, uh, you know, the vineyard that we had was trained Scott Henry and we broke it down to Gio, uh, which is huge massacre of this vineyard. Uh, it's going to take a while for us to see our yields build back up. Um, but this whole methodology is that we are honoring, trying to be as healthy to the core of the vine as possible so that the longevity of these vines can go on for a century, which I trust those Italians on that. I do. Um, we don't have that time here mm -hmm. that we, to have learned that yet. We're still so young in the industry. So, um, so I want to learn more about that. And, uh, and just the more hands-on I can get, just so that I can be a more well-rounded instructor. And that is, is really the, the, the call there. And then, you know, as I make wine, you know, it goes hand in hand. And so being able to make those calls of what happens in the vineyard so that it then affects, you know, the wine you're making. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an important marriage of, of information to have. So again, I'm too timid to tell you I will own a vineyard someday or I will, you know, do any of that. But I do know I want more education on it. I want to continue seeing the differences of, of, of when we harvest in the vineyard and how it's trained to the winemaking style and continue that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've, you've brought up uh, 2020 a couple of times already. It's mm -hmm. been a, obviously a question we've been enjoying asking, or maybe enjoying is the right word. We've been asking mm -hmm. uh, in the post 2020 interviews. Tell me about that year for you uh, and for your various the various things you're working on. Uh, what were the biggest adjustments you had to make? What were the biggest decisions you had to make? And, and how did you come out the other side? Yeah. Um, uh, I think it's a ongoing learning experiment or learning opportunity for me with smoke taint. Um, I knew of it. I knew as a song, right? And as someone selling wine, you, you could taste it. I could smell it. I, I think that's why I just, I prickle at it um, so intensely. Um, even though there's plenty of wines out there with some on it and a lot of people enjoy them mm -hmm. and that's great. Um, I could benefit from a lot more um, diving into the data that we do have. I've started um, being a part of some of these. There's, there's different commissions, wine commissions, that will offer seminars and um, Zoom meetings and things that I've been a part of. But it still just feels like, at least for me, we're just, we're just like dusting the surface before we there's not much, there's not much that I have learned that you, you can't save, you can't save it, mm -hmm. but there's some things you can do to, you know, mitigate it or, um, try to respond to it. And I think it's unfortunately something we will be continuously dealing with as we move forward. 
Um, so we're looking to Australia as being the foremost authority at this point, just because they started that research a lot sooner than us. It's affected them a lot more than, than us mm -hmm. um, for a longer period of time. Um, so yeah, I think that just highlighted how much I need to learn on that topic. Mm -hmm. um, and I was fortunate that the fruit I sourced from Eastern Washington was relatively unscathed. Um, but the other fruit I had chosen was um, kind of in the Hood River Hills area of the Columbia Gorge, beautiful little vineyard. But I mean, I had been out there, I think, a week or two before I picked, and it was that day where you couldn't even see in front of you. Um, and you know, as an Oregonian who's, you know, we brag about our air quality and our water quality, and uh, I think we had the worst in the world or something at that point. Um, so, and I mean, I remember going, I think this is, this is bad, this is a problem. But I still, you know, I like looked at the fruit and I was like, I think it's gonna be fine. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't fine at all. Uh, and I wish I had, that's experience, right? Like you have to have the experience to know when to make these really tough calls then. And I was a new winemaker picking up my second year of fruit by myself with a sad little trailer hooked to the back of my car, sitting out there for eight hours getting sunburned. Um, just trying to make it all work. I, as soon as my fruit was loaded, my trailer had a flat tire. It was like just, it was one of those days we, we're, we brought it back to the winery that didn't have proper electricity for lights, so we're in the dark. It was after midnight. We got headlamps on. There's pincher bugs everywhere. If you're not aware, Oregon wine grapes, for some reason, the pincher bugs just come out of nowhere. It's crazy. Ugh, it's so gross. Anyway, so it was just such a thing, and I remember just being like, like just let's get this done. So the smoke taint thing was so far. Mm -hmm far away mm -hmm. um, that I didn't have to deal with it till much later. I decided to make a white Pinot and a rosé of Pinot and a red because of that. To me, I was like ultimate learning experience, right? I'm going to use the same fruit and I'm going to do these three different styles and then I'll be able to like have them in my class and whatever. But it's just like smoke, smokier and smoke. <laughs> like, <laughs> But you can't taste it right off the bat, which is interesting. It kind of starts to come out. And so again, that's something that I'm learning and it actually just gets worse and worse and worse in bottle. So I just have a whole bunch of this stuff bottled. I don't know. So that's, that is it. I think the decision to distill, I at one point, right in the beginning, was like, I'm going to just put the wine in bottle. I'm going to call it Dumpster Fire 2020, and I'm going to sell it for, I think I was going to sell it for 12 bucks and donate eight of it to, you know, fire, research, whatever. I was like, that'll be good. I'll get the money back to cover glass and whatever. Um, and then I was like, oh my God, it's so much work, though, just to bottle it and to get the glass and to get the corks and the... So I really did have to just think about it for a long time and at the end of the day, distilling it made the most sense to me. Because again, as a new winemaker, if the first wine you try of mine is Dumpster Fire 2020, <laughs> where, the, where was that gonna do? You know, like that's not a way to start a career. Um, so I don't know what I'm doing with this brandy, but maybe someday I will make a port style wine and I will have my own alcohol to fortify with. That's kind of the thought, or I'll get creative, I don't know. But at least it's something that somehow that felt like the healthiest choice for me to make with that part of it. But I do have other wine in bottles that I actually um, was talking with a gal at Aimsire Distilling, which is a cute new distillery. Have you been there in Portland? All women run. It's all sexy in there. And they're looking for rosé to make a rosé gin. And they're specifically trying to collab with like young winemakers and female winemakers and, and especially on the smoke taint. So it's a way to, and I love gin. So I'm gonna be like, just take my wine, take, give me back a little gin and we're fine. <laughs> so we, I've had a chat with them and, um, and I'm hoping that works out. I don't know if I have the right volume that they need, but that's how I see this mm -hmm. being a success. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to pull the wool over anyone's eyes and, and try to trick them into drinking this wine. Um, also, I feel like I should just say, like, not all smoke tainted wine is always awful, but unfortunately this is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's really about time, place, varietal, uh, all the things. And I just I'm out, I'm was... Out smoke. Uh, yeah. And I just had, was in the smokiest of smoke, smoke, smokes. Yeah. With the lightest skin grape we have, so... Yeah, not good.
You mentioned that you're working for a Washington winery mm -hmm. now. How, how did that come about and what's your role? Uh, that was a pandemic shift. Um, that uh, was, yeah, I was basically going into 2019, 2020, the teaching at Wine and Spirit Archive was ramping up to be completely full time. I was so stoked about it. Pandemic happens, no in-person learning was to be had. Um, so I still had the production going. Um, I was, you know, laid off of all the jobs, totally unsure what I was going to do next. Um, it's an assistant winemaker position. Um, it's a lot of the same things I was starting to do. I was excited to try it in a new region with, they work with um, like almost like 30 varietals. It's crazy because they do a lot of blends. Um, so it's always shifting what's happening. It's all women um, winemaking team. And yeah, it just seemed like the right thing to do for right now. As I keep saying, I, you know, I think it's taken me a long time to identify as a winemaker. <laughs> Um, this has helped <laughs> because I do it now also full time. Um, but uh, yeah, just to see what other people are doing and, and I'd like to do more of that. And I feel like I'm a little late to the game on the jumping around for different harvests, uh, like literally physically <laughs> late to the game. But I am still hoping to do that, um, to go, uh, you know, work a harvest or, or be a part of a harvest, and both in um, uh, the Southern Hemisphere. I'd like to go to New Zealand or Australia um, again, and I'd like to do Spain and Italy, and um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm, I don't think I'm someone that can go be an intern anymore and, you know, be a cellar rat, but I do think I would like to just be a part of it and, and see what I can learn and just see what's happening around the world. I also just want to go everywhere so that I got to make it, you know, go together. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, you were you were a pretty early adopter of the Oregon wine industry, grow, growing up here and being around it. So I'm curious uh, in all your all your travels, all your experiences, what are the biggest changes you've seen in Oregon wine? What does it look like now compared to kind of your early impressions, and and where is it going next? Hmm. Well. Um you know, don't quote my my numbers on this, but when I was a child, I think we had less than 40 wineries. Um, by the time I was able to drink, it was 400-ish. Now we're over 800. I think well over 800. Yeah. Um, so that has changed a lot. And it has been interesting. As someone who, uh, you know, grew up in Albany, a lot of people who are from small towns don't want to claim their small hometowns, you know. Uh, I do, because I want you to be like, she's awesome, Albany must be kind of cool, <laughs> um, or something, I don't know. Uh, but I had a wonderful childhood, uh, but I wanted to get right on out of there as soon as I graduated high school. No, uh, no disrespect, but I, I had done everything I needed to do in that town. My folks still live there, I have wonderful friends that still live there. Um, but it actually took, I think, zipping all over the world for me to A, realize how much I love the Pacific Northwest and how there's no place better, and how I actually came from wine country and had disassociated, you know, I was like, I'm never living there again. And then I'm like, how weird that my whole world and career is kind of bringing me right back to where I started. I just don't identify with that. I just think of it as like, oh, that's, you know, the tiny town with the grass and stuff. Um, so, yeah, so it's grown a lot. It's changed a lot. It's, um, you know, I just spent the weekend in McMinnville and I'm seeing all the changes here. And when I say changes, I'm saying new, fancy, expensive hotels and restaurants that are opening. It's a both and, right? You need that progress. You need the tourism. That's what's going to, you know, benefit your local economy. Um, I'm seeing it all throughout wine country. You know, we used to kind of just have Allison in as like our fancy spot mm -hmm. and more things are popping up. Um, I do think that is a, a, like just a train that is not gonna stop. Um, like I said, with sleeping on Chardonnay or whatever, it's uh, shocking how many people still haven't discovered us, even though we've grown from 40 to 800, like I said, and the tourism has only kind of gone up and up. So I think that's gonna continue. So I think, as long as the folks who are doing the city planning and the zoning or whatever 
um, are making smart, sustainable choices so that we can handle that kind of mm -hmm. tourism. I think it can benefit everybody if we do it in a smart way. Um, I am seeing a lot of, uh, you know, the natural uh, wine movement. I use that in quotes because we do not have a standard. That frustrates me. Um, I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of old, old world or European wineries do natural winemaking. Um, and they seem to all kind of be on the same page, and here I'm not seeing that. Mm -hmm. And that I don't, I don't enjoy that because again, it's it's turned into a little bit of a trendy word that people are talking, like throwing around. And then what I see people do is that they don't want to drink anything other than nat quote unquote natural wine, when potentially all of it is natural wine or not. Or I mean, most winemakers that I know, and I know a lot of them. Um, and I've worked with a lot of them, and I've visited a lot of them, and I've seen their practices. Almost everyone has really, really good intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, we are talking minimal intervention, working with what you're given, being a good steward to your land. And I think that is vitally important, so much more than whether or not, you know, how much SO2 you use, which I think is also vital in winemaking and preserving it. Um, so yeah, so I think, I hope to see, um, I don't know, I hope to see, I don't wanna say I hope to see regulation, that's not it. But remember when our beer scene was like, okay, we had Widmere and whatever, uh, and then all of a sudden it was like, you know, 22 craft breweries and now who knows, 200. <laughs> uh, but then it's kinda got a, you know, like a pendulum swings, but we've kinda gotta, we gotta hone it in too. Mm -hmm. um, or I think it just kinda gets a little, a little chaotic. Um, so I'd like to see, we are seeing it in, um, I feel like Oregon has done a really good job of um, having like, I don't know if it's called the Oregon Wine Commission here. No. Oregon Wine Board. Oregon Wine Board, thank you. I feel like they've done a really great job um, and a lot of people are as kind of like bringing awareness to s all these things, keeping people on the same page about things and, and also like adding in, you know, DEI training and um, I, I, I think that kind of, the community staying as a community is I think what what is really important. Because um, we need to all be in this together and um, yeah. And obviously we talked a little bit about what's next for you, but tell us a bit more about what's next for your work and uh, your brand and, and everything else. Um, yeah, I, um, I hope, you know, to continue teaching more and more as now in person's back. I love it so much, I really do. Um, and so I, I hope to continue that. Um, I hope to continue making wine um, for myself slowly and building up my business plan and business model um, so that I know I'm executing mm -hmm. the vision of it that I, I think uh, is important. Um, and for me, it's also then building in opportunities for travel. Um, I'd like them to be work-related. That can sometimes work in the educator position, right? Um, but also, I've dreamt of being an Italian wine ambassador for that reason. Um, I'd, I'd like to continue, like I said, traveling to other countries to um, experience their harvest and crush and, and just pick up as much of that as I can. Um, yeah, I have a lot of different ideas for the future. They're all wine related. <laughs> um, but basically, the more that I can continue to round out my personal education, um, is I think what I'm after the most. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping by next year it'll be, you know, kind of a five years into my personal brand, which to me only feels like then the beginning. Uh, as someone who moves slowly like that, and all my friends are like, we want your wine, and I'm like, just shh, <laughs> next year <laughs> we'll start the process. Um, yeah, and I really see opportunity, um, I don't know if I made this clear, but when I talk about the different parties and events I want to throw, I have so many skilled entrepreneurial friends and colleagues 
and I love to network and I love to collaborate. And these are not just a party to have a party. I want it to be the, the place that it's held has meaning, mm -hmm. the food that is served is thoughtful, you know, the, uh, the whole experience. I really, I, that to me is important. I don't, I don't know how to say that in a better way, but I want to um, connect with all the people in the industry that I admire and respect so much, and I want to, to create these opportunities for all of us together to um, kind of expose everyone. So, you know, wine can be such a, a nice unifier and such a, a reason for people to get together, but then if I can be using, you know, my friend's cheese <laughs> and my, you know, mm -hmm. this other, you know, this farm's um, meat and beef and, and uh, the produce coming from here. Like that's, that's important to me just because that's somehow how I was raised here in Oregon, just hyper local and fully aware of the bounty that we have. So I want that to be a part of what I can offer so that you might find a new thing that you're now you know, mm -hmm. gonna gonna follow and and explore. Yeah. All right, that's all the questions that I have for yeah, you. Yeah, that was a lot of talking. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> is there anything we didn't talk about? Anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything you'd like to cover that we didn't cover? Um, I don't think so. I mean, there's so many facets of all of these things, but um, no, I think I I wandered around the topics enough. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your story with us. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here.